Right, hello Year 10. Um, today we're going to be looking at Storm on the Island by Seamus Heaney, linking this poem to the themes of physical battles and metaphorical battles. So let's dive right in. A bit of context here. Um, Seamus Heaney, who is the poet, grew up in the countryside of County Derry in Northern Ireland. So that's this bit here. He wrote many poems about nature and his experiences of a childhood spent outdoors and on a farm. And much like Wordsworth, nature was for Heaney a source of both beauty and fear. So here's a very famous quote by Wordsworth, who writes the prelude. He was fostered alike by beauty and by fear. So by fostered, he kind of means uh, raised, like both of those qualities had an important role in shaping his childhood and who, who he became as he grew up. So, um, and Heaney actually quotes this um, in another poem. So this was a really important sentiment for him. And you can really see that kind of duality of nature, that it's both beautiful and terrifying in lots of Heaney's poems. And this is Heaney here. So important context um, about the time within which Heaney was writing. Uh, he lived through and wrote poetry about the Troubles. Um, this was a name given to a violent civil war that took place in Northern Ireland in the, in the late 20th century, so 60s to the 90s. The conflict was between, this is a very simplistic version by the way, but the conflict was between the mostly Catholic nationalists who wanted Northern Ireland to be part of Ireland and then the mostly Protestant Unionists who wanted Northern Ireland to be part of Great Britain. And I should also be said that this was largely also the fault of British imperialism, um, uh, as so many conflicts in the world are. But that's a very simplistic way of, of kind of summing up the conflict. What's important for you to know is that this conflict resulted in lots of civilian deaths, as you can see by this like shocking image of a man with a huge gun um, just a metre or so away from this young family. Um, communities there often felt constantly under the threat of violence. So the violent storm that's described in this poem is often interpreted as a metaphor for the political violence dominating Heaney's country. So that sense of um, we're under threat from this, from this violent and dangerous storm and it could um, attack us at any moment. Uh, that's kind of a metaphor for how it could feel living in Northern Ireland when all of this civil unrest was going on. You can see there probably the British army there getting involved. So yeah, there is a physical battle that he, uh, Heaney's thinking of, but it's described through this metaphorical battle between man and nature or between the islanders and the storm. So let's uh, read the poem now. Um, I've got a little glossary for you there, for some unfamiliar words. So, Storm on the Island by Seamus Heaney. We are prepared. We build our houses squat, sink walls in rock and roof them with good slate. The wizened earth has never troubled us with hay, so as you can see, there are no stacks or stooks that can be lost. Nor are there trees which might prove company when it blows full blast. You know what I mean, leaves and branches can raise a tragic chorus in a gale, so that you can listen to the thing you fear, forgetting that it pummels your house too. But there are no trees, no natural shelter. You might think that the sea is company, exploding comfortably down on the cliffs, but no. When it begins, the flung spray hits the very windows, spits like a tame cat turned savage. We just sit tight while wind dives and strafes invisibly. Space is a salvo. We are bombarded by the empty air, Strange, it is a huge nothing that we fear. So I want to start right at the top with the title itself. So it's important to notice that there is no definite or indefinite article at the start here. A definite article is the word the, and an indefinite article is a or an. So it's not the storm on the island or a storm on the island. It's just storm on the island. Now that might seem like a pretty inconsequential detail, but it kind of suggests that this poem is not so much about a specific storm, the storm, but more like an ongoing feeling of threat and danger for which the storm is a metaphor. Now here's something that's interesting. So the, the parliament in Northern Ireland is often referred to as the Stormont, okay? 
Now, you're probably already noticing that word is very similar to the word storm. So perhaps the title contains a subtle pun, remembering that a pun is a play on words to do with the way that they sound similar. So a pun that implies the political nature of the violent storm described in the poem. So it's very subtle, but perhaps right from the beginning, Heaney wants his readers to draw links between the, the metaphorical battle and the physical battle, which is, is highly political in nature, hence this nod to the Northern Irish Assembly. Uh, and here we could have possibly another pun. So Ireland obviously sounds the same as Ireland, the country that is currently being ravaged by this storm of political violence. However, there's also um, <laughs> absolutely lots of real, very real islands in the Atlantic that could have inspired the poem. And around these islands, the sea is very cold and the winds are very harsh. So it's not so much that an island like this uh, or a storm like this wouldn't exist or didn't exist or that Heaney didn't see one. It's perhaps like um, Heaney saw this storm on the island and he married that with the storm that he was seeing uh, in his own country, this kind of political military storm. Quick, uh, quick notes about form and structure. This is a dramatic monologue. So there's this sense that it's a resident of the island. So someone who lives on this island and he uses the first person pronouns, uh, first person narrative throughout the poem. This helps us feel real empathy for their precarious condition. We're really drawn in. The very first word is we. So we almost feel included as a reader. So that's really important for kind of the emotional punch of the poem. It's free verse, which means there's no rhyme scheme. So it's not like um, something like London, which has a very controlled rhyme scheme. Um, it's not got an A, A, B, B or an A, B, A, B. That's not here, okay? So there's a kind of looser uh, control over the poem, perhaps reflecting the lack of control that the islanders have over the storm. And the word for that we'll use is free verse. There's one single stanza, so it's not split up into, into different stanzas, which I think is a really great way, I'll just show you the poem again, to represent the island graphically, because you've got all of this space around the poem on the page, and the poem itself is isolated and kind of clubbed together the way that the, that is so pointless, I don't know why I did that, but the way that the islanders have to kind of club together um, to kind of battle this huge nothing. So visually, Heaney's recreating that for us. The poem itself looks a little like an island. I think that's a really important point. Uh, so yeah, the block of text is isolated, surrounded by empty space as an island is surrounded by the sea. Now, the reason this goes back to it being free verse, yes, it has no rhyme scheme, but it does have a fairly subtle iambic meter, okay? a pulse, an iambic pulse, and that is where it goes from unstressed to stressed. So we call that a rising meter because it gets more stressed as it goes forward. Ba-bum, ba-bum, okay? That second syllable is stronger. So this pulse captures kind of the power of the storm and a sense of rising danger. So this kind of reflects the poem's um, structural trajectory. That kind of means its structural journey from feeling prepared right at the beginning to the huge nothing of the final line. So there's really a sense of, of a rising uh, feeling of danger as the poem goes on. Okay, so now I want us to do uh, a bit more close line analysis. So we'll go from the very beginning. So as I said, we're prepared, we build our houses squat. We've got that inclusive, that plural first person pronoun. And the repetition of we in these opening line really emphasises right from the beginning the sense of a community and collective responsibility. So if we're going to have this battle against this storm, we all need to be as one. We need to be a we. And as I mentioned, perhaps this we even makes the reader feel included. So there's this kind of intimate tone. We feel like uh, we're part of something right from the beginning. We are prepared, we build our houses squat, sink walls in rock and roof them with good slate. So look at how many of the same sounds we've got repeated here. Houses, squat, sink, and then rock and roof. So we've got this alliteration. Now, if we've got this impression of a community needing to be like a tight knit community, so we're all coming together, buckling down our defenses, then this alliteration kind of heightens this sense of a necessary closeness 
through what we might call, if we're feeling really fancy, a kind of sonic claustrophobia. So sonic just refers to sound, and we all know that claustrophobia is that kind of in a tight space and fear of being in that tight space. So we can't really escape these S sounds or these R sounds. And that's kind of similar to this sense of not being able to escape the island and not really wanting to escape your community because you're stronger as a we rather than as an I. And again, I've mentioned the form. Consider how the form as a single stanza, the lines themselves are banded close together too. So we've got an island of words amid a sea of open space. The wizened earth had never troubled us. So the word wizened, I actually put that before, but it kind of means like uh, wrinkled and ancient. So it's kind of subtly personifying uh, the, um, the earth. And it's kind of saying it looks worn and old looking. And perhaps it looks that way because it's been mistreated in the past or seen a lot of war. And this is absolutely true uh, when we think about the history of Ireland. They have been ravaged by British uh, colonialism, so the invasion of the British people and the, the, the control that the British people sought out of Ireland. For centuries, there has been civil war there before. It's been a country that has um, been really badly affected by famine. So perhaps this is a subtle nod here. Remember this metaphorical battle uh, to the fact that his country has already been through a lot. OK, so it's pretty wizened already. Um, and it's never troubled us with hay. Now this is kind of tricky, but this is a kind of ironic or gently sarcastic tone here. We've never been troubled with much hay. Uh, so the land isn't very fertile. It's hard to grow crops and food there. Um, and perhaps this is a subtle allusion to the troubles hinting at the symbolic nature of this poem. So remember this word troubled, a little subtle hint that we're talking about the troubles here. That kind of gently sarcastic or ironic tone is very quintessentially Irish. Oh, we've never been troubled with too much food. You know, it's kind of like making a sort of dark joke. Um, we've never been troubled with hay. So as you can see, there are no stacks or stooks that can be lost. So we've got this half rhyme here, stacks or stooks. They sound kind of similar, but don't quite rhyme. Sameness, indifference. So we don't really have everybody being the same, but we're all in the same situation. Um, so, as we move forward, we've got this lightly sarcastic tone continued. So, nor are there trees which might prove company. So, i.e. there are no trees around to keep them company, giving them uh, materials to build shelter or defences with. So, trees are very important if you need to build sort of strong structures to protect against a storm. And also, there's perhaps a possible pun here again. This is absolutely littered with puns, this poem. Because uh, a company is the word that you would use for a group of soldiers in the army. So again, we've got what we might call military diction. Um, I wish I could write that down. What do we think? No, I'm not going to try and do that. Military diction. Um, so, nor are there trees which might prove company when it blows full blast. Ah, alliteration again. And in fact, if you want to be super fancy, letters like P and B, we actually call them plosives because of that kind of really strong, hard sound they have. So you can call this plosive alliteration, which is so appropriate here because um, the hard sounds of blows full blast really recreates for the reader the harshness of the strong wind. And I've thrown in a little link with another poem here. So you might consider a comparison with exposure in which Owen writes, in the merciless ice e winds, uh, the merciless iced east winds that nive us. So this idea of the violence of nature and of winds is really um, reflected in that poem too. Uh, it blows for blast. You know what I mean. Leaves and branches can raise a tragic chorus in a gale. So we've got direct address here. He uses the you. You know what I mean. Um, and it's kind of informal, it maintains that intimate tone created at the beginning. It kind of feels like a friend is talking to us. And this last line, these last lines here are important. So we've got, um, uh, when the wind blows, it can raise a tragic chorus. So that's like a sort of a mournful song in a gale so that you can listen to the thing you fear, forgetting that it pummels your house too. This is a really powerful idea. So. This wind is something that's attacking you, but the way that the wind sounds when it blows the leaves and the branches kind of sounds like a beautiful, sad song, so that you can stop, be distracted by it, and listen to it, 
forgetting that actually it's pummeling your house too, this thing that kind of sounds so beautiful. So the wind sings a song that can distract you from the violence that's been done to your house. Does Heaney suggest here that we can become complicit, kind of like involved, part of, forces that are actually damaging us? So um, could this be a nod to the, the effect that propaganda can have because it makes us feel a real kind of involvement and a real sympathy and then you kind of become involved in a force that is actually doing violence to your own people. Um, so consider Northern Irish citizens who might have become embroiled in nationalist or unionist violence. And then perhaps an even deeper thought, is Heaney suggesting that his poem is a distracting tragic chorus in itself? Um, because this is nothing but a mournful song, uh, perhaps hoping to distract us for a moment from violence. So perhaps there's a self-consciousness here as well. Um, and I've just put in a little bit here from Bayonet Chard, bullets smacking the belly out of the air. That is another great use of plosive alliteration, just like this one. Okay. So he goes on to describe the fact that there are no resources on this island. So there are no trees, no natural shelter. That repetition of the word no absolutely um, emphasises the absence of these protective resources. And again, I'm just going to link this to politics because the denial of resources to Ireland has been a tactic of British colonialism there for a very long time. And you might want to look up the Irish potato famine uh, for the most tragic of those. Um, but also I've put another link here with the idea of being shut out and denied. So you might think about this line from Exposure, shutters and doors are closed, on us the doors are closed. Again, both poets use repetition, closed, closed, no trees, no natural shelter. It really hammers this idea of being denied something home. Um, this is a lovely line. You might think that the sea is company exploding comfortably down on the cliffs, but no. So he considers whether the sea could be company, so whether it could be a resource that we could find useful. And he uses this lovely oxymoron, so that's where you kind of collide two opposite ideas and sentiments. So exploding comfortably. We would never normally put exploding and comfortably together. They seem like they connote kind of opposite experiences. But I think it's a really smart device to use here. Because if something's exploding comfortably down on the cliffs, that gives it kind of a sinister power. Like for the sea, exploding is nothing that's comfortable for the sea. Um, and yet for us, it's such a powerful threat. So it's kind of capturing the sea's mysterious power. And its comfort is in sharp just juxtaposition, sharp contrast with the discomfort and fear of the island's inhabitants. So the sea is comfortable, we are anything but, because we've got no trees, no natural shelter. So nature is really overpowering us here, a little bit like in the prelude when um, the Wordsworth is so overpowered by the mountain that it looks like comes to life and punishes him for stealing that boat. Anyway, that idea is completely shot down, but no. Uh, so the idea of potential company is abruptly dropped here. Two monosyllables, but no, followed by a caesura. So this is the pause here by this colon. Uh, it's very sh uh, sort of makes this shift sudden and jarring. You might think there's company down there, but no. When it begins, the flung spray hits the very window, spits like a tame cat turns savage. So this is lovely. This is probably a line that's really worth um, memorising for the exam, or at least parts of it. So the sea that's exploding comfortably on the rocks around the island, the, the spray coming off those waves hits the windows of the houses on the island. So it comes up right, right to your house. And he uses a simile here, like a tame cat turned savage, to dramatise this wild animalistic violence of the water. So the water cannot be tamed by humans, just like this kind of, this cat that's turned savage cannot be tamed anymore. So this threat is uncontrollable and savage. And note, you've also got this sibilance here, bringing that savagery to life. So you've got the spray hits the windows, it spits like a tame cat turns savage. So that spray is almost brought to life through that soft S sound. And that's something we call sibilance. And again, I put in another link to a poem here. This kind of made me think of this line from Bayonet Charge. 
a yellow hair that rolled like a flame and crawled in a threshing circle. So this idea of trying to kind of capture wildness and savagery through an animal um, metaphor. Well, this is a metaphor, this is a simile. So this is a great line as well. Space is a salvo. So this is a new word. It was certainly a new word for me when I read the poem. A salvo is a military tactic where soldiers fire bullets at the enemy simultaneously. So everybody fires at once, just going crazy. Uh, so the space surrounding the island, it attacks the island in this way. So that blankness that surrounds them is like a military attack, firing bullets at the island. And again, I think of exposure, sudden successive flights of bullets streak the silence. So that idea of violence in silence, violence in space, there's a real parallel there. Uh, we are bombarded by the empty, air, uh, the empty air. So bombard is a very powerful verb. It means to attack continuously with bombs, shells or other missiles. So together with Salvo, we've got this really military, militaristic, semantic field. So the words in this poem very much connote the military and connote those physical battles that we know were happening in the country at this time. We are bombarded by the empty air. Strange, it is a huge nothing that we fear. I think these uh, final lines are what we call ambiguous. So that kind of means there's more than one interpretation available. Um, the idea of being attacked by and fearing empty air and a huge nothing perhaps connotes the futility or pointlessness of violence. Or perhaps he Heaney really wants to communicate the hidden, invisible nature of the threat his country faces and the feeling of being vulnerable to attack at any moment. So perhaps by saying it's a huge nothing that we fear, he's just saying that this violence is empty of any true authentic meaning, that it's, it's futile, um, uh, it has no, no good purpose to it. Or perhaps he's merely saying that it feels like what is attacking us is invisible. It looks like it's nothing. And that's kind of the, the thing that makes it so sinister. And I'm just going to remind you one last time that visually this poem looks like an island surrounded by empty white space. So as we, as we end the poem, it's a huge nothing that we fear. The reader actually encounters a huge nothing. They encounter blank space. So I think that really punctuates Heaney's point lovely, in a lovely way. Um, and I've just included a couple more nods to other poems. Perhaps we could link this idea of the futility of violence to this lovely line from Bayonet Charge, king, honour, human dignity, etc. dropped like luxuries in a yelling alarm. Um, or this from Exposure. This is a refrain, so it's a repeated phrase in Exposure. Nothing happens. A huge nothing that we fear. So obviously I think the most natural link is between uh, Storm on the Island and the Prelude, uh, which I think we got you to write an essay about or at least a couple of paragraphs about in class because those are both uh, centering on the conflict between man and nature. Nature absolutely powerful and winning um, and kind of each representing a different battle as well because Wordsworth is kind of a battle, a moral battle and his spiritual development between like the, the crime of stealing the boat and then the feelings of guilt afterwards and Heaney's battle with nature is actually about a political military battle that was dominating his country at the time. So absolutely, man versus nature, the conflict between the two, that links with the prelude. The power and violence of nature, again, the prelude, but also, as you've hopefully seen in those few quotes I've scattered throughout, bayonet charge and exposure. Um, they can conflate the military battle that they're talking about with the power and violence of nature. So they kind of come from the same root in those poems. The politics of war, we could even look with war photographer there or charge of the light brigade. So while for the charge of the light brigade, their battle was for glory and honor, this battle is just a huge nothing. And it's, a, it's an invisible threat, it's, it's space, it's empty space. And again, that idea of futility with exposure and bayonet charge. So I hope this has helped you remind yourself of what this poem's about and you feel ready to do your work.